Good morning, everybody. I uh, We did a recording, which you're going to see in just a second, and it cut out the beginning of it. So I'm restarting it just so uh, you can see the very beginning part of what I was saying, which was a good morning to all of you for joining us with this special Grace Lynn Book Talk. My name is Bren Lopez. I'm the manager of Children's Book World in Los Angeles, where we celebrate diversity, knowledge, and enrichment, a world where every child sees themselves on our bookshelves. I'm really excited because we are here with Grace Lynn, who is one of my favorite multi-award winning authors. And she's such a powerful and creative representative for taking pride in your culture's history, their myths and creativity, and helping to share that with the world. Grace's newest book is Chinese Menu, The History, Myths, and Legends Behind Your Favorite Foods. And now we're gonna to talk to Grace about this book, Behind Your Favorite Foods. This is like, Grace, this is like my favorite kind of book. I am like an <laughs> encyclopedia nut. I have been since I was a little kid. And this is like so beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm very proud of it myself, I have to admit. <laughs> I can't even imagine the amount of work that went into this book and the research. You must have had, did, how many people helped you with research or did you do it all yourself? Oh, I definitely had, I, I actually hired a research assistant. Um, so, uh, she was a Smith College student in Chinese studies and she helped me with the bulk of it. But even after that, um, at Little Brown, we had uh, two, two copy editors who uh, were very fluent in Chinese and Mandarin and who also like went through it with a fine tooth comb. So I had many people, hope, many people uh, helping me go through it, make sure it, everything should be fairly accurate, accurate, <laughs> as oh, accurate as myths yeah. can be. <laughs> I can't wait to talk to you more about it. Um, I want to let everybody know we have so many schools from all over Southern California, all over the country who are participating with us watching this video. And we really appreciate you being here with us. Um, Grace Lynn is the award winning and best selling author and illustrator of some of your favorite books, Where the Mountain Meets the Moon. Starry River of the Sky and When the Sea Turns Silver. Of course, we can't forget the wonderful Pacey Lynn stories uh, <laughs> with Dumpling Days. And, um, and then coming up, we have the Mid-Autumn Mood Festival. So we have Thanking the Moon and so many of your picture books um, that you have done uh, have won awards that continue to impact kids from the beginning of their reading days up into uh, middle school and beyond. Uh, Grace is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. She lives in Massachusetts. She has some amazing author friends. I actually, we have a, a good friend in common, Lisa Yi, who I know is part of your, your writing book author club, right? You have your little- uh, Yeah, we have our little like, we don't, uh, honestly, we don't actually meet up that often, but we have like this text chain that we like talk about and talk to each other every day. <laughs> and you are both, you both this last, uh, you, you know, you know, last, last two years have been focused, seems on amazing food books, uh, <laughs> yes. right? Related to uh, Chinese history. And yeah, that's great. I love it. That is true. <laughs> Um, so tell us about, I know you want to, you're going to read part of the book as well, but tell us about Chinese menu. Okay, so Chinese Menu is a collection of uh, about 40 stories all about the history, myths, and legends behind your favorite uh, Chinese food or American Chinese food, really. Um, so so uh, I like to tell people like, oh, well, have you ever gone to a Chinese restaurant and had dumplings? And they'll be like, yes, yes, of course. And I say, well, have you ever noticed that the dumplings are in the shape of a person's ear? And they'll be like, oh, now that you mention it. And I said, that is because the dumpling was actually invented by an ancient Chinese doctor who invented it as a medicine to cure people's frostbitten ears. One day in winter, he was walking around, he saw people with frostbitten ears. And so he went home and he said, I gotta make, I have to make them a medicine. And so he made this dumpling and he filled it with warming herbs and spices and meats. And he made it ear shaped because he wanted people to remember what this medicine was for. And then he gave it to people said, eat this. And if you eat it, it will warm you up from the inside and cure your frostbitten ears. Well, I don't know if it ever cured anybody's frostbitten ears, but people really like the dumplings. And so we still eat them to this day. So that's just one of the many, many stories in uh, my book, Chinese Menu. Um, the book is actually um, separated just like a menu. So it's got appetizers, uh, chef specials, desserts, and the stories behind each one. 
How long ago uh, was that? So there's a story with the doctor creating the dumplings. How long ago was that in our history? Oh, very, very long ago. In <laughs> fact, uh, the story span so many uh, years and dynasties. I actually put in a timeline here. So you could see there's like a whole timeline. And I love the it. dumplings, the dumplings was one of the earliest ones. And um, that is in the Han dynasty, which is like, um, maybe earlier than, than to, to earlier than 220, 220. <laughs> so a long wow. time ago, <laughs> a long, long time ago. But that is what is amazing to me. The impact of this one doctor trying to heal this community with food, um, and doing so in a way that impacted the world like paper, like, uh, uh, like printing, like a firework, like all of these things that have been created and for their for communities. He's impacted so many people and so many cultures around the world. With his, <laughs> who doesn't love dumplings? If you but, don't like dumplings, you're... <laughs> I know, and it's so funny because he's impacted so many people with his dumplings, yet it was not his intention, but what ha how it has impacted people, it was not his intention at all. <laughs> wow. wow. All right, now... This is what is special about this book, I think, is that there's so many things for so many different types of people. So kids who love mythology and folklore and stories like that are going to love this book. But kids who love facts and history and reading through appendices and all of that are going to love this book as well. There was so much information I loved at the end of it. Um, what was your favorite part of creating this book? Oh, what was my favorite part? Oh, <laughs> my favorite part was going out to eat many times to find <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> um, so one of my favorite foods uh, at a Chinese restaurant is Peking duck, but it's a very special dish. You don't like, you don't just have Peking duck on a Friday night unless you are writing a book <laughs> that has Peking duck in it. <laughs> and so I was very, uh, I, my favorite part was using the book as an excuse to have special meals like that. That's so funny. I could imagine you saying to your editors, you know what, I need another two months of research <laughs> before, we're, before this book will be finished, just for a chance to be able to go to eat all of these delicious desserts and foods and, and every soups and everything mm. that is, is in the book. You also include a recipe, which I love. Tell me about the recipe that's at the end of the book. Sure, the recipe at the end of my end of the book. So um, a lot of people get a little confused because they think it's a cookbook. In fact, I've seen it like on Amazon and they've like categorized it as a cookbook and it is not a cookbook. No. <laughs> uh, it, it has one recipe in it, which I think does not qualify it as a cookbook, but it does have my mother's scallion pancake recipe in it. And um, so a scallion pancakes is actually uh, very, it has very simple ingredients. Uh, which is uh, why it's so popular. The ingredients uh, is actually scallion pancakes was popularized by a Buddhist monk because the ingredients are so simple. He could carry it around with him anywhere. But um, to make it, I don't know if it takes skill, but it takes a little bit of time. You kind of have to like roll it into like this like sausage and like coil it and roll it again, <laughs> this kind of thing. Uh, so it's, it's a little... Um, little time consuming to make but once you make them and they're just so delicious so it's one of my favorite things to eat especially fresh I do not make them often uh, my mother and I did not make them often but when we did I I remember it vividly oh I yeah I, I felt when I was reading this book I could smell the foods sense memory of foods but also so much is tied into family and what like like food actually is the experiences that you have as a child with your grandparents with your cousins with your mom and dad of going to places to eat of making food together can you talk about the importance of that of did you have an experience as a child of making food making dumplings or or doing things like that with your family yeah you know uh, I we, I have many memories of like making dumplings with my mother and and I talk about making the scallion pancakes with my mother. I can't remember uh, if I mentioned like we only had one rolling pin. Uh, so and I have two sisters. So we were always fighting over the rolling pin. And in the end, we like some of us had to use like um, 
wine bottles <laughs> to roll <laughs> to roll our our dough like we were just taking anything round to roll so i re kind of re remember rolling with a with a wine bottle and like the label getting like stuck in there like <laughs> so um i have lots of memories like that but um the memories that i love to focus on in in this book um are not so much the cooking memories but the eating memories the dining mm -hmm. memories you know uh because the book talks about the food that we ate at home and the food that we ate at the restaurants um just the things that like the jokes my father would make while we were eating with chopsticks he there's a, a story in there where I, you know there's a myth that people ate with chopsticks to test for poison and my dad used to make the same joke every day like let me check for poison <laughs> with his chopsticks. You know, so th those are all the memories I really cherish. It's the shared memories of eating together. That's so interesting, too, because you're having that experience with your dad when you're a child and finding out that this is part of a history of the, of the food itself, uh, that your dad was carrying on that tradition of it. Well, that's incredible. That's such a wonderful thing. Well, you know, uh, I've been thinking about this story, this book for a long time. I've actually been collecting stories since like 2004, since um, I wrote and illustrated the book Fortune Cookie Fortunes. And uh, so my dad uh, likes to tell a lot of stories. So whenever he would tell a story about a food, I would always like kind of scribble it down. Uh, but when we decided to make this book, Chinese Menu, and uh, they said, oh, we're going to classify it as nonfiction. Uh, that, that's when I had to get the research assistant <laughs> because I was like, I don't know if the things he told me, if they're like, they have real roots in Chinese culture, or he just like made it up, just like, this is a funny story to tell. So um, yeah. that was that was the tricky part, was trying to figure out what really had roots in Chinese culture. The, the chopstick ones did. There was a couple that did not. <laughs> That's, you know, so I think a lot of kids will have their own histories that they're thinking about with food, uh, even within their own family. And uh, some of it may be Chinese based, some of it may be Korean based or Latino based, just depending on what your, your background is. Ownership of recipes and ideas about food and how things are made. I mean, I'm sure that because there's so much information in your book, there's going to be someone, well, that's not the way we did it in our house. But talk about that. Like, why? I think that's wonderful that there's so many different versions of things uh, when it comes to food. Yeah. And actually, that is what the heart of this book is about, um, because I talk about it as American Chinese food. And so um, I'll go back to the inspiration for this book, which was uh, when I, I said I made the book Fortune Cookie Fortunes. And when I made that book, Fortune Cookie Fortunes, back in 2004, that's when I first discovered that the fortune cookie is a completely Asian American invention, right? So <laughs> if you go to China, nobody knows what the fortune cookie is. And I remember I told this to a lot of friends and they would say, oh, so the fortune cookie is not even really Chinese. And they kind of said this with like a tone of disdain. And that always made me feel really strange because um, I was born here in the United States. Um, I had a very, um, uh, I felt very tenuous about my own heritage uh, being born here in the United States. Sometimes I liked being Asian, sometimes I did not like being Asian. And I could uh, easily hear people say the same thing about me. Oh, she's not really Chinese, you know, mm. and that really <laughs> bothered me because I'm very proud of being Asian American. And I feel like the fortune cookie should be very proud of being Asian American. Yeah. And um, I really wanted to do this book as a way to give respect to this Asian American food because all of the food that I mentioned in this book, it's really American Chinese food. So it's really American food. So it's it's Chinese food that has been influenced by American taste. It's been adapted, it's been changed. So if you have Kung Pao chicken here in the United States, and then you go to China and you eat Kung Pao chicken, it is very different. <laughs> it might have the same name and it has the same history, but it tastes very, very different. It's a completely different thing. And that is not bad. And I think that's where I'm trying to change kind of the prejudice of, towards this food. Uh, the idea being like, oh, this is not good because it's not like authentic. It's like, uh -huh. no, it's authentic in a different way. And that's not a bad thing. This 
in some ways, um, in some ways, I think it's more delicious. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever had General Tso's chicken, um, oh yeah, <laughs> original versus what we get here in the United States, I, I like the the United States version. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, before you know. I want you to I want you to read um, something from the book, but I wanted to ask one last question in the in uh, with what we're talking about, and that is um, in talking about Chinese food in America, um, it. The reason it spread around so prolifically within the country was because of a lot of bias against Chinese people uh, in parts of our history. Could you talk uh, a little bit about that in terms of why uh, so many restaurants opened in different places and um, how it, it spread? Sure. I mean, there's there's a long, long history um, uh, of Chinese restaurants here in the United States. And one reason why there's Chinese restaurants is because uh, there was a time in the United States when there was the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, where uh, the United States did not allow uh, Chinese immigrants to really have jobs here in the United States. They, they, there's, they, were, they didn't allow Chinese to immigrate to the United States, but there was a couple of exceptions. And the exceptions were if they had a business of their own, like a restaurant. And so the only way that Chinese people could come to the United States was to open a restaurant. Uh, not, I mean, not the only, there's a couple other ways, but that was one of the few ways that they that Chinese people could come to the United States and survive and thrive. And so that's why Chinese restaurants was such an important thing. Um, and it's it it's also been a wonderful thing because it's really shown the cuisine has uh, become, like I said, um, the Chinese food here has really become American food. I mean, wonton soup, lo mein, it is just as American as pizza or hot dog, you know, or, or hamburgers. Uh, but there's kind of a little bit of a bias. We don't understand that. We still see it as Chinese food, even though the hamburger came from Germany and the, you know, like, and, and mm -hmm. apple pie came from, from is Dutch, you know, so like, this this it's all american food it just has roots in another country um yeah. and i think the other thing that is kind of um tragic is for chinese chefs to make a living here in the united states um they had to price their food really really cheaply to entice people to try it and so it gave this impression that chinese food is cheap food and um, that's not, that is completely uh, not true. I mean, to cook Chinese food is just as complicated as French food. And what I'm hoping to show in this book is that it has just as rich and wonderful history as any of the other cuisines that we put up on a pedestal. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, the, the idea of America is a melting pot, which is all obviously has its own food based ideas because America isn't a one culture or one, it is all the different cultures. That's what makes it so wonderful. And so you have this impact of, of uh, those Chinese foods interacting with Mexican foods or interacting with uh, German foods and depending on the community that they're in, and then they become something else that's new and different flavors that you try to uh, do for the community. I just think it's so wonderful. Um, it is wonderful. I mean, what I uh, in my I think in my author's note, um, I say this American Chinese food. You know, we kind of dis disdain it. You know, and say uh, and say it's it's not authentic or anything. But this food is, I feel, is like the taste of America. You know, like it's it's the flavor of resilience. It's the flavor of thriving here in the, in a new country. You know, it's all of these beautiful things that make this this country really a great place to be. And that's what this food is the flavor of. So I would love for you to be able to read part of the book. And this is about one of my favorite foods, uh, chow mein. Yes. All right. So I would love to share this story with you. Um, let's see. And this is the story of chow mein. Now, do people know what chow mein is? Let me show, let me just share, just so you know what chow mein is. I'm gonna share screen. Just give me one second because um, sometimes I am. <laughs> We're good. Sometimes I am a little bit 
Okay, slideshow from Curse. Okay, so this is Chow Mein. Hopefully, uh, now that you not, see the picture. It's not showing yet, Grace, just so you oh, know. It's, it's not showing? Okay, no, try show, sharing one more time the page. Okay, one or, more time. Okay. Is that showing? No, we're not seeing your share. Um, oh, now it is. Now it is. It just okay. took a second. Now we can see okay. it. the story of Chow Mein. Okay, hold on. I'm going to play. Okay, now do you see the slide? We see the slide. I okay, good. <laughs> All right, you see the slide. <laughs> um, I I cannot see you anymore, which is very sad. But um, I'm as long as you can see the slide, that's great. Okay, so yeah, this yeah. is Chow Mein, and uh, the story that I would like to tell you is uh, the how this the origin story of this um, dish. All right, and it has to do with these four dragons. So. You might recall the dragon kings of the four seas. Back in ancient China, there, were, there was the black dragon of the North Sea, the red dragon of the South Sea, the green dragon of the East Sea, and finally, the white dragon of the West Sea. Now, these four dragon friends, dragon kings, were friends, but they were also very competitive. Each was always trying to outdo the other and show off. I can crack the clouds like an egg, Red Dragon bragged, and the rain pours like a waterfall. A waterfall, mocked White Dragon, while your rain is nothing more than spittle. Ha, said Black Dragon, don't make me laugh so hard. My tears are more water than, your, than both your rain put together. You might make rain, Green Dragon replied, but you move your clouds like a sleeping tortoise. And so on. Finally, one day, after a particularly tempestuous argument, the dragon kings decided to test one another's skills. On the sixth day of the sixth month of the year, the four would meet over the Yellow River and have a rain and cloud shifting competition. However, when Black Dragon won, the other three demanded a rematch. So they agreed to meet again the next year at the same time and date. And of course, when White Dragon won that time, another rematch was made. And soon it became a yearly tradition. The four dragon kings found it great fun. However, it was not fun for all the people who lived by the Yellow River. The dragon king's games caused the river to flood dangerously, destroying homes and temples. We must have angered the dragon kings, the villagers said to each other. Why else would they cause us such devastation? So the villagers bought, built a temple, hoping it would please the dragon kings and make them forgive whatever wrong they had done. But when the sixth day of the sixth month came, the temple was completely unnoticed by the dragon kings and was promptly destroyed during their game. The villagers tried again with a grander temple. It was also destroyed. They tried again with an even grander temple. That too was destroyed. It isn't working, the villagers said. There is nothing we can do to appease the dragon kings. Perhaps we should forget about the Dragon Kings, one of the villagers said. Instead, we should concentrate on the river. I have heard of a village far downstream that created a dam to protect it from the floods. Let us learn from them. So the people began to make their own dam to protect their village. It was hard work, but all were determined to finish before the sixth day of the sixth month, refusing to return home even to eat. On the fifth day of the sixth month, the men of the village worked through the night, determined to work even as day broke. The women, concerned for their husbands, fathers, and sons, also woke before the sun rose to make food for the workers. One of those women was Shanggu. She was a smart, capable, and most of all, observant woman. Both her father and husband were working on the dam, and she noticed that the bun and cakes that she had brought them earlier had quickly spoiled and had grown mold in the hot, humid weather. She wanted to make something that would not spoil as they worked. Yet the only thing Shanggu had to cook, was with, cook with was coarse wheat flour. As she stared at it, Shanggu thought that if she made flour into a dough of thin strips and, and stir-fried it, perhaps that would protect it from spoiling as well as make it easy to reheat. As she tested a small batch, an appetizing aroma wafted from her pan. When she added water, the smell became stronger and even more delectable, and a quick bite told her that it was just as wonderful to eat as well. Shanggu ran to the other women in the village to tell them about her invention. Soon, all the kitchens were filled with mouth-watering 
food, the enticing smell of Shangri's noodles. And what about the Dragon Kings? Well, by this time, the sun had risen and the four Dragon Kings had assembled to start their game. But the captivating aroma was distracting them. What is that smell? Green Dragon asked. I don't know, Red Dragon said, but it is making me hungry. It smells delicious, Black Dragon said. We cannot begin until we know what smells so good, White Dragon declared. All the dragons agreed and began to search for the source of the wondrous smell. They flew up and down the Yellow River, over and through many villages, but they could not find the origin of the smell. Where could it be coming from? Black Dragon moaned, almost in despair. How can we find out? We will have to ask Jade Emperor, Green Dragon said. He will know. The others concurred, and they all quickly flew up to see Jade Emperor at his palace in the heavens. Please, the four dragon kings begged, tell us where that smell is coming from. The Jade Emperor readily consented to, to their request, for he too smelled the tempting aroma. Using his divination powers, he deduced that the smell was coming from the kitchen of Shangu. Go to this woman, Jade Emperor said, and invite her to come here to make this food. I want to try it as well. When the four dragon kings appeared in front of Shangu, she was extremely surprised, but she was happy to accompany the dragon dragons to the Jade Emperor's palace and make her newly invented stir-fried noodles for all the heavenly court. As the members of the court, the dragon dragons, and the Jade Emperor himself praised and devoured the noodles, they asked Shangu about her creation. I wanted to make something for my husband and father to eat that would not spoil since they could not come home to eat, Shangu said. Why could they not come home to eat, Jade Emperor said. Because they are working nonstop to finish the dam before the sixth of the month, Shangu replied. Why must they finish the dam before the sixth of the month, Jade Emperor asked. Because every sixth day of the sixth month, the Yellow River floods and destroys our village, Shangu said. At this, the four dragons looked at one another in guilt and embarrassment. And why, Jade Emperor said, looking directly at the Dragon Kings, does the Yellow River flood on the sixth day of the sixth month? The Dragon Kings gulped. Uh, that is when we, uh, Dragon, Green Dragon bowed his head have a little competition with each other? I see, Jade Emperor said, his eyes piercing as he looked at each of the Dragon Kings in turn. I think you should not have this competition anymore. Do you agree? Each of the dragons nodded, shamefaced. So, when Shangu returned to her village, she was delighted to tell everyone that the floods were over. The villagers, of course, were elated and began a jubilant celebration that seemed to never end. Even now, every year on the sixth day of the sixth month, people continue to celebrate by eating Shangu's stir-fried noodles, known today as chow mein. So, let's see. Okay. <laughs> Stop sharing. All right. <laughs> so that was my story. Um, of, uh, well, it wasn't really my story, but that's the legend of Chow Mein. Um, if we have time, I would love to teach everybody how to draw their own Chinese dragon. Do we have time? Oh, I don't hear you all of a sudden. Did I do something? I had muted. I had muted myself, so okay. I didn't uh, <laughs> cough while you were reading your story. <laughs> so, um, no, we definitely have time, and I would love um, uh, to. I may ask you a few questions about the creation of the artwork while you're doing the drawing uh, display. So go ahead and share that. And okay, all right, hold on one second. We're going to do this technology thing again. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsie, hold on. How was all of the art created? So the the cover. So the cover of the art, and like I said, this book is separated into different sections. So there's sections that say like soup or tea, or like here's a section on chopsticks. And um, these are done uh, traditionally. I use paint and paintbrushes, and I just painted those pictures. Um, but the other art, um, <laughs> this, this art, um, it's actually the first time I've ever used the computer. Um, I drew Ooh. the drawing 
uh, I drew the drawing using pencil and paper. Um, and then I scanned it in and I kind of cleaned it up um, using using the computer, which was the first time I've ever done that and colored it in using the computer. And so, like I said, it was the first time I've ever done that. So it was very exciting and a little nerve wracking for me. Okay, can you see the let's draw a dragon together? Yes, and if you, I, we see that, yep, we see it, great. Right. Um, I think it's actually, if you could do uh, the slideshow, there we yes. go, now, yeah, okay. it comes right up. All right, so um, I'm, hopeful, I'm hoping that um, people got this template um, I know that I, I sent um, I sent the link to to you and I'm yes, hoping all that... the teachers have it. Okay, great. So hopefully everybody has this piece of paper. All right, because so this paper will help us draw the dragon together. We're going to draw a Chinese dragon together. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you know that there's a big difference between a Chinese dragon and, and uh, a European dragon. The Chinese dragon, even though the ch Chinese dragons in my chow mein story were kind of naughty. Um, <laughs> They are they are in, they are actually really good inside, and they're kind of like uh, very. They're supposed to be uh, like gods, you know. They're they they have lots of powers, and that's very different from the European dragons, who are kind of like monsters and beasts. All right, so everybody get this piece of paper, and we're gonna draw a Chinese dragon together. And the first step to drawing a Chinese dragon is to draw the eyes. And to do the eyes, we're going to make something that looks like a pair of glasses. Now, do you see where I started that drawing here in this square? So it's kind of in the upper middle. Don't start it right exactly in the middle. And don't start down at the bottom either, or else you'll definitely run out of room. <laughs> but and don't do it at the very top either. See how it's in the upper middle? Find right there in like just where I started my drawing and find that in your square. And we'll do the same thing. So then you go here and you make a circle, a line, and a circle, just like that, all right? So that's step number one with the eyes. After you have the eyes, we're gonna do the dragon's horns. Now dragons, Chinese dragons have two horns. European dragons have all, like they can have 10 horns, three horns, one horn, but a Chinese dragon always has two horns. So right where the line meets the circle, I want you to make a sprouting line that comes out like that. All right, after you make that one sprouting line, I want you to make three humps that come in. Do you see that? how that's kind of like a lowercase m? So one, two, three. Three humps that come in. After that, I want you to make a line that goes halfway down and stop. So start, start where that lowercase m was. Make a line that goes halfway and stop. Don't go all the way. You see how it, it didn't go all the way? Just halfway. That's one horn. Now let's go and do the other horn. So find where that line meets the circle on the other side. And just like the first time, you're going to make a line that sprouts, sprouts out, but it's going to sprout out in this direction. Okay. After you have that line sprouting out, you're going to do another lowercase m, but it's going to come inside. So it's kind of like a backwards lowercase m. So three humps. One, two, three. All right. After you have those three humps, you're going to make another line that goes halfway down, just like that. OK, so you have two eyes, two horns. Let's finish off the horns by connecting the horns together with a straight line. So now your horns are connected. Your eyes should be like that and two horns. OK, now we're going to do the dragon's eyebrows. All right, to do the dragon's eyebrow is very easy. You start here above the eye on the dragon's horn, and you're going to make something that looks like a three humped butterfly wing. So come over here and go one hump, two hump, three hump, and end right on the eye. All right, that's one eyebrow. Let's go to the other side and do the other. So above the eye on the horn, start over here, one hump, two hump, three hump, and right on the eye. So two eyes, two horns, two eyebrows. All right, now we're gonna do one long snout. To make the snout, just go from one eye to the other and make a nice U shape. But do you see how there's a lot of space underneath that big U? That's because we need room to make the mouth, the chin, and the beard. So don't make your U so long. Don't make that snout so long that it takes up all the room on your page. You need space at that bottom, okay? so. Make a nice U shape, long, but not too long, and make sure there's lots of room on the bottom. All right, so there's your dragon snout. Now you want your dragon to breathe. So we're gonna give our dragon some nostrils. 
by doing a little swirl on one side and then doing a little swirl on the other. Now your dragon can breathe. Okay, now let's give our dragon a mouth. He's a pretty happy dragon. So go over here and just kind of make another kind of uh, big happy mouth like that. You know, uh, just a, an upside down rainbow. All right, from there, like I said, that's his mouth and he's really happy. So let's give him a big toothy grin, okay? So give him some teeth. Look how happy he is. All right, after your dragon is smiling, showing all his teeth, let's give him a chin to hold up all those teeth, right? His teeth are just like hanging out there. So he needs something to support his teeth. So we're gonna do the chin. And the way you do the chin is first, you start from one corner of the mouth and you're gonna make kind of a curved line that comes out like that. All right, then you're gonna go to the other side. You can make another curved line from the other corner of the mouth that comes out like that. And then you're gonna connect those two lines together with another curved line. So now your dragon has a chin to hold up all those teeth. <laughs> all right, now here's something that might be really interesting for you to know. Chinese dragons never ever have wings. Uh, I know when you think of a dragon, you often think of a dragon with like these huge bat-like wings flying through the sky and burnt, blowing fire. Well, that is not a Chinese dragon. Chinese dragons don't blow fire. Uh, they usually, uh, if they blow anything, they'll be blowing steam or water <laughs> because they're usually, they usually have things to do with water. And they, all, they do fly in the sky, but they don't fly with wings. The idea of a Chinese dragon is that the Chinese dragon is so powerful that if he wants to go anywhere in the sky, all he has to do is say, hey, hey, wind, take me there. Hey, clouds, float me over there. He's so powerful, he doesn't need wings. So if you ever see a Chinese dragon with wings, someone has made a mistake, and I have seen that before too. So you could tell them too, Chinese dragons don't have wings. But Chinese dragons always have mustaches. So even though your Chinese dragon doesn't have wings, he does have a nice swirly mustache. So give him a nice swirly mustache. And not only does he have nice long swirly mustache, he has a nice long beard. And so we're gonna make a beard, but the, we're gonna put whiskers on our dragon. But I wanna put a lucky number of whiskers on our dragon. So I don't want you just to put any old number of whiskers down. I want us to put eight whiskers on our dragon because eight is a lucky number in Chinese culture. The reason why eight is lucky is because when you say the word eight in Chinese, it sounds like the word for uh, fortune. So, uh, so you know, it's a homophone. Do you know, like when we say the word flower, it could be in like a rose or a daisy, or it could be that stuff that we bake with. That's a that's a homophone. And so the word eight in Chinese is a homophone. So let's put eight whiskers on our dragon. And the way we do that, whoops, we skipped something. Well, put eight there, and then one, and then do the last step after you put the eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then dot in the eyes. And there you have your lucky Chinese dragon. I hope you feel lucky. <laughs> that was great, Grace. I love it. Um, I we have a little bit of time left, just a few more minutes, and I wanted to uh, take some some of the students. From different schools sent us in some questions and from grant elementary school we had questions from yavitz izzy kaya lu asking about what made you want to become a writer when you were a young person um and did you have any setbacks um and what do you like about it okay so so there's many questions there let me start with the beginning did uh i oh you know the truth is I always, always loved books. Um, when And I loved not just reading books, but I loved making books. Um, so whenever there was a school project, I always made a book. I remember very vividly in fifth grade, we were studying the Vikings and my friend Jill made a Viking helmet and my friend Heather made a Viking boat, but I made a book about the Vikings because I thought making books was so much fun. Uh, so I always loved making books, but I never thought about uh, making books as 
it's a job or like as a career or like being an author until I think about seventh, the end of seventh grade, the school, school year was ending. And as I was leaving seventh grade, um, my um, writing teacher stopped me and she said, Grace Lynn, I notice you like making books. And I said, yes, yes, I do. And she's like, well, I found this contest where if you write and illustrate your own book and you send it in, and if you win first place, they'll actually publish your book. I think you should enter. And I said, okay. So I took the entry form and all summer I worked on my book and I worked so hard on it and I made it as beautiful as I could. And I sent it into this big national contest. And about maybe nine, 10 months later, I got a letter in the mail. I did not win first place. I did not win second place. I did not win third place, but I did win fourth place. And with fourth place, there was still a cash prize. There was a cash prize of $1,000. I couldn't oh. believe it. It was so exciting. But that was winning that prize was the first time that I realized, oh, wait, you could actually make money making books? Like this could be a job? And when I realized that, that's when I realized I wanted to be an author when I grew up. So that's why uh, I think very early on, I, I really wanted to be an author. Now, did I have any setbacks? Yes, I had. Unfortunately, it's one thing to want to be an author, uh, <laughs> another thing to become an author. And there was quite a few setbacks. Um, and there's many times that I thought um, I would not become an author. Uh, one of the things that was really difficult for me early on was that um, nobody seemed to be interested in making the kinds of books that, uh, or publishing the kinds of books that I want to make. As you can see, most of, most of my books feature books with Asian characters in them. And when I started, oh gosh, it, over 20 years ago, uh, there wasn't a lot of people interested in publishing books with Asian characters in them. And so that was really difficult for me, but I'm so glad that times have changed and uh, it's getting, it's, it, I won't say it's easy, it's never easy, but it's easier to publish the books that I wanna see in the world. Yeah. And there was a third question, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> well, the third question is about what you love about writing still. Uh, Oh, what do I love about writing? Mm -hmm. So I really love stories, if you couldn't tell. Like I love myths, I like legends, I like any kind of stories and I love sharing stories. So the fact that um, I can write or draw and the, a story and it's shared, um, it's, it's just the funnest thing to me. I know there's a lot of artists who just like to paint pictures and that, and there's, they're just happy to have one picture. And like, it's just like a beautiful picture of a flower mm -hmm. and they're very happy with that. And I, I'm very happy for them that they like that. But for me, that's not enough. I want this picture to tell a story. And that's what I like best. So many uh, kids uh, of all ages, uh, now adults for some as well, uh, love the Where the Mountain Meets the Moon series and love the Pacey Lynn Dumpling Days series. Have you had uh, young uh, authors who are starting now uh, come to you and tell you the impact that your books had on them being able to see themselves on shelves for the first time? Oh, I have, and it's been really amazing. Most of the people who, um, it's also been a little bit strange because I know I've been doing this for a long time, uh, but at the same time, I don't feel like I have. So mm -hmm. I'll have somebody <laughs> who's like, I read your book when I was a kid. And I'll be like, am I that old? <laughs> I guess I am. They'll be like, you know, because they'll they'll be parents themselves. And they'll be like, they're like, I just had my, I just had my baby and I can't wait to share the book I read when I was a kid to them. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> How old am I? <laughs> but I'm but I, even though that gives me a little bit of a shock, I am I am honored and thrilled and I'm glad that my books have become a part of their lives and hopefully a part of their kids' lives. Absolutely. And also your books uh, continue to be able to um, share a view of the world that some people in some places in the United States itself don't actually be able to have that. And I know that right now we're all in, not necessarily everywhere, but in lots of places, their uh, attempts to be able to make sure that certain books aren't being able to be seen. And um, we support the freedom to read books for kids to be able to read books about everything. And um, 
you are just amazing. You know, you talked about your artwork when you were doing it. You're like, oh, and I just did this. And I was like, oh my God, just did this. But you, you, not only are there all like 40 stories and, and there's all this beautiful artwork and it is just incredible all the time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's so exciting to have another, another world that you're immersing us in with all of this. Um, now you're touring, so are you going around, you're going around and seeing students in person? Um, yes. So um, uh, I'll, I'm actually going to be in your area, I think the 15th yeah. of September. So uh, is that the day that this is showing? I don't know what day today is. <laughs> yeah, that, a, lot of students, a lot of students will see this uh, on, on the day that it's showing. Uh, the book itself is about to have its birthday. Yes. <laughs> coming up on Tuesday, right? So we're going to yes. celebrate the book birthday and then you'll be here for that. Uh, do you love touring around and meeting kids all over the country? Um, yes and no. Um, I love meeting kids. I do not like <laughs> traveling, especially uh, I feel like um, the plane plane travel has become quite unpleasant recent, like in the last, uh, you know, since the pandemic, honestly. Yeah. Uh, so traveling, I have to admit, is not my favorite thing. But meeting students, I love that. So like if yeah. only, you know, I don't, maybe I'm showing my age, but you know, Star Trek where they had that beam technology where they could just like beam. I really wish that was true now. I, I would dream love about that. it. I <laughs> dream about it. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, Grace. I'm so glad to be able to have had this experience with you and to be able to share with so many kids out there today. Um, I hope that while you're traveling around, you get to taste some delicious local foods while you're doing that as well. Um, Yes, any I'm last words? I can't wait. <laughs> any, any last words for the kids? Uh, any last words for the kids? Uh, all I can say is that I hope that you enjoy um, my books, any of my books, but especially this one, uh, because I think that if you read this book, it'll make your food taste better. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, everybody have a great day. And I think you should all talk your parents into going to have some delicious Chinese food to prepare uh, for reading this book next week. So um, everybody have a great day. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.